Good afternoon. Welcome to Virtual Balticon 54 and the panel book discussion, The Pursuit of the Pankara. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Tilden. I also go by JT. If you hear the, uh, the gentleman with me refer me to that way, I've got that there in my tag. Um, and welcome to the Pursuit of the Pankara discussion. Um, I am the current president of the Highland Society, um, coming to you outside of Baltimore, Maryland, longtime Balticon attendee. And um, very briefly, um, turn it over to uh, my co-panelists here. Um, first, Steve Wilson. Um, I'm Steve Wilson. I am also a member of the Heinlein Society. I'm an author, blogger, publisher, and used to be a podcaster, but nowadays not so much, and uh, have been reading Heinlein since I was in high school a long, long time ago. And I'm Don Sakers, a science fiction fantasy writer, retired librarian. Uh, I review books for Analog, and I've been reading Heinlein since I was in elementary school. Ooh. And that's a lot longer ago than it was with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you win. And, and I actually met him, so. Wonderful, maybe we'll get to that story at, at, at the tail end. So I got a couple of housekeeping things. So this is a webinar format uh, for Zoom. So unfortunately, we can't see you all out there. Um, you are welcome to use the chat to be able to, to have side comments. And if, we, if, uh, if uh, Steve and Don are able to chime in and, and use that to react, that's fine. You may also ask questions through the Q&A function. Um, we welcome you to do that and we'll get to those as we can. Uh, I think we'll probably get there about two thirds of the way through to really look at the questions and answers that you're having in there. But uh, before that, we do have a bit of a panel discussion to start with. So um, for those of you who may be completely um, unaware of, of, uh, of Robert Heinlein, his influence and some of the facts of his life, I've got a little bit of an overview first and a little bit about the, the Pursuit of the Pankara book and, and how it's come to be. So um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of those facts first. So, so Robert A. Heinlein, um, he lived from 1907 to 1988. He was a 1929 graduate of the Naval Academy. He was discharged from the Navy in 1934 due to tuberculosis. He began writing to pay the bills. During his lifetime, he published 32 novels, 59 short stories, and 16 collections starting from 1940. He was made SFWA's first grandmaster in 1975. Okay, so first audience participation thing, please all of you out there, tell me through the raise hand function that, that you have, um, if you have already read The Pursuit of the Peck Era all the way through to completion. All right, and I'm waiting in here in terms of attendees. Okay, so we've got about seven, eight. Uh, give you guys another couple of seconds to be able to figure that here. Because what I have to do is I have some, um, I have some slides that I'm gonna show. Hopefully you'll be able to see them through there. And um, um, this is basically, we'll say it a couple of times, spoiler warning, if you haven't read it and you intend to, well, you're gonna find out details now. So you, you might wanna sign off if, if you don't wanna hear about details, but otherwise, um, all right. And it looks like um, it's about a third or so of the people that, that, that have already fully read it. So if you don't wanna be spoiled, um, you know, you, you probably should stop listening. Otherwise you're gonna hear some details from us. So let me go in here and share uh, just a couple of screens for some context here. And Seems like it's sharing okay to me. So I will tell you guys uh, that we're here. So again, this discussion is uh, hosted by the Heinlein Society. We've also got some input from members of the Heinlein Forum discussion group on Facebook. A couple of us have some things that, that we're sending in advance. And uh, I think some of you guys are probably also Heinlein Forum discussion group members here. Um, so how did this thing come about? So it was this thing called the Panky Barsoom, Number of the Beast. Um, Highland wrote it in about, uh, uh, finished in the tail end of 1977. And he wasn't really happy with it. He, uh, he marked it to, uh, to destroy it and not have it go to his full archives, but it wasn't. So when um, we looked at, at the archive, you can see that this, the, what's on the screen right now there from box 109, uh, labeled as Opus 176 right, within the Highland Archives, that was the work of the Panky Barsoom Number of the Beast. That was this first draft of, of the thing that happened there. 
Now, um, after a time, Hanlon pick, picked the, the idea of the story back up again, and he actually finished The Number of the Beast in December of 1978. All right. You can get the, the actual file of Opus 176 available from the HeinleinArchives.net for about $15 total for all, all the pieces. Or you can go and look at it, UC Santa Cruz, where Highlands Archives are hidden. Um, what happened was um, that uh, the, the storyline for this, this Panky Bar Syndrome of the Beast and the germ of Pursuit of the Pancare uh, was licensed from the Highland Prize Trust. And uh, the published material was published by Kazik, uh, SF and Fantasy. Um, Kazik Publishing started with a Kickstarter with some premiums and collectible edition, but the book Pursuit of the Pancaria is now freely available from Amazon. Um, but here's what's actually in Opus 176. Some of the things I, I took exactly from, from my copy there. It's Highland scribbles. There's things that are in, in, in his, you know, in, in his handwriting when, when, when uh, you know, he typed, but then he added to it. Um, if you ever had a doubt that Heinlein, the math in all of his things, this is proof that, that it, within the manuscript, yeah, he was doing the math to make sure the numbers he was using were there. And if, if any of you thought that Heinlein was perfect and everything that, that spewed right out and ne never had any kind of editing whatsoever, uh, the page there on the right is proof that no, he did edit himself. He just didn't belabor it. And when he was done, he was done. So this this thing from Kaze of Publishing, that's some cover art there, The Pursuit of the Pancara, with a concurrent reissue for Number of the Beast. And for those of you that... Uh, aren't in such things about the first third of the book there on the left is what is common between Pursuit of the Pancara and, and Number of the Beast. And then there is a point in page, at page 152 of Pursuit of the Pancara, you see that tiny little little four mark there that's, uh, that's there. That's where it shifts over from the commonality to the new stuff. So if you don't have the book, if you haven't seen it yet, that's kind of what you're missing for those, everyone that, that's physically seen it picked up and and look for it. And again, that is um, the end of the facts. And from here on in, it's all spoilers. So you have been warned. Stop sharing and, and we're back now for all of us. There we are. And so that's enough of me talking, and if I'm doing this right, now I will moderate between uh, the two esteemed gentlemen I have with me, and maybe offer a point or two on my own and wrap things up at the end. So, so first off, um, Steve, at the very high level, then <laughs> how are these books different? <laughs> I know I know you've got that prepped, so. Yeah, I do. Um, so I did a quick plot rundown. Do you want to hear, do we need to hear a plot rundown? Do you think it's, for a lot of us, it might've been a while since we've read The Down yeah. to the Beast? Yeah, so fairly quickly. Um, they are very similar in structure. Uh, they share, as John said, the first 150 some pages. And then there's more pages that are very closely ripped out of one and dropped into the other. Um, basically it starts, both start with a line, he's a mad scientist and I'm his beautiful daughter. Zebediah John Carter meets Deja Thoris, D.T. Bur Burroughs at a party. Um, and she's there to shill her dad's uh, work. He's a scientist. He has created a time machine, not just a time machine, but a machine that can travel between universes. Um, and very quickly, somebody starts trying to kill him and anyone around him because he has this technology. Um, so as all rational people do when they're fleeing for their lives, uh, Zeb and Dee and Jake and his longtime friend Hilda stop, get married, get pregnant, and then flee their home to find other universes and a safe place to have babies. Um, in Number of the Beast, they first go to an alternate Mars, which is a British colony where the aliens that have been trying to kill them are actually kept as slaves. Um, and then they leave there and go visit the Land of Oz. They visit Wonderland, they visit Lilliput, and they along the way developed the philosophy of pantheistic multi-person solipsism, which explains why any universe they visit is probably a place that two or, two or three or four of them have already read about. Um, after several arguments, one near divorce and at least one rigged election, and they all take turns being captain, Hilda winds up being the captain of the troop and they settle down on a planet with advanced medical science to have babies. But first they decide to take one last trip through the cosmos 
and they meet the Long family, the stars of Heinlein's popular future history series, La the immortal, almost immortal Lazarus Long and his family. Uh, and they wind up introducing the Longs to this technology. They take them on a tour of all the places they visited and discover that someone, the author, is erasing their tracks. Places they've been have ceased to exist. Any record of their existence on their homeworld has ceased to exist. And they kind of shrug and decide to put on a science fiction convention, inviting <laughs> Heinlein's author friends and pretty much all of the characters he ever created. And that's how the book ends. Who the bad guys were and what their motivation was is never revealed and becomes downright irrelevant. Uh, Pankara does follow very much the same structure until the end. Instead of a British colony on Mars, they actually visit Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom. And they meet Dejah Thoris, and they meet her son and his wife. Uh, they meet some honest-to-God green-skinned Tharks. Um, then they visit a lot of the same places they did in Number of the Beast. And uh, then they meet the Lensman, and they have a long interregnum with Doc Smith's Lensman. And uh, then they go find a planet to have their babies, and they have their babies. In fact, they have four babies. And then they decided, oh yeah, we, were, we had these aliens trying to kill us. We should go wipe them out of existence in every universe that we possibly can. So they join the Lensman, and they go to war. So Number of the Beast ends with a science fiction convention. Pursuit of the Prankara ends with a war. Some of us who have been in the business would argue there's not a lot of difference there. Um, <laughs> both say this is what can happen when you bring all of these characters together across universes. And there's a, there's a sly reference in uh, Pankara that um, in that final battle with the big bad, the Starship Enterprise and the Galactic uh, Patrol and the Legion of Space were all there fighting alongside. So that's pretty much the rundown. So Don, um, yeah. I know we, we've done a little bit of prep on this. So in terms of that rundown, then one of the points I know that you wanted to talk about was this characterizations and, and how they're different. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> there, I found that there were subtle differences in the characterization and, and one of the ones that I liked better in Pankara was, um, for those of you who have read Number of the Beast, and, and, and let me pre preface this by saying I like the Number of the Beast. I, I think I'm the one person in the entire universe who likes it. Uh, but I found myself getting really impatient with the constant bickering and the whole, you know, well, I was captain and this didn't happen. And, and so you have to be captain for a while and then blah, blah, blah. And in Pankara, there's a lot less of that. And they kind of very quickly settle on Hilda as being the captain. And I, I found that to be, I, I found that to make the characters more likable. Um, th there was a point when I first read Number of the Beast where I was like, oh, come on, can't, can't the bad guys just come and kill them all right now? So I don't have to listen to this anymore. And um, didn't feel that way in Pankara. Yeah. Steve thought about that? Um, yeah, the, the, the bickering is very, uh, really very out of character for Heinlein. One of the things that people say about Heinlein is his characters tend to be very, very emotionally healthy and secure. Mm -hmm. And, and the, at least your, your protagonist, good guys, don't fight a lot. This is probably the fightiest, uh, the infightiest book he ever, a number of the beast that he ever wrote. Yeah, I, I think that's, now I'll admit, I don't reread a lot. So I haven't reread Number of the Beast in quite a long time. I'm going by the impressions I had from it. But yeah, the talking, and again, like you say, the bickering. You know, and then the ending in that party, I always kind of gave Heinlein a pass on it because I said, well, if he thought it was his last book, what a way to end up. So, yeah. so you know, Number of the Beast and, and that party and all that. But, but, uh, but yeah, I definitely enjoyed the characterizations, the flow, the whole Lensman bit you know, was, was something that was like, wow, that really just reads better in terms of something that I want to read for that. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, the characterizations, um, I want to throw something out, out uh, to you and a shout out, because I know she's actually on, on the, um, the, um, the chat right now listening to us, but within the Highland Forum, we're doing a discussion currently this weekend, and Catherine Schaefer, who's a society member and also a member of the Highland Forum, had a really good observation, and I want to get your guys' take on this cold. 
because I think it's a really good thing for, for discussion here. Um, so Catherine, all credit to you, I managed to do it. Um, she, she, she wrote out for the group that, that Pankara struck her as being in the style of Glory Road, while Number of the Beast is in the style of Farnham's Freehold. Nominally the same idea, but developed very different. So gut reactions for you guys, go. Whichever one of you wants to talk first. Um, I think I can see that. Farnham's Freehold also does have more of the, the infighting and the politicking. Yeah. Um, and and Pankara does have the more, the, really the more stock uh, characters because it's got the actual Lensman and it's got some of Burroughs uh, characters. Um, I... Yeah, I, I would go with that. And down to, I enjoy Farnham's Freehold more than I enjoy Glory Road. And I like <laughs> I like Number of the Beast better than Pankara, so. Hmm. Okay, good theory I, then, Don. I can see the point and, and it's, a, it's a good one. And uh, like Steve said, uh, you know, there, there's, there's resonances. The, the problem I have is, is saying that Glory Road and Farnham's Freehold are basically the same story told in different ways. I, I, I don't really see that. Okay. I, I guess that's fair. That's what I sprung it on you. <laughs> that's what we're all talking here. We, we can't be too agreeable. We have to have some discussion. Here, yeah, right? yeah, of course we do. Um, when well, are we going to have an election yeah, for moderator? And, and now I'm saying Ka Catherine here is saying, so, so she's correcting me, that she meant Pankara and Number of the Beast were the same story different ways. Oh, so does yeah. That, does that change a bit on, on then on the... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then that's just your imperfect moderator then. Uh, oh, and, and she says, and not what John said. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. She's Catherine, it's like a married to you. Goodness. <laughs> but, one of the things that I wanted to mention before the panel was over, and, and I guess I'll stick it in now so I don't have to keep remembering it. Um, in, in the, Heinlein wrote a really short, about page and a half essay that's included in the biography of him by Leo Stolver. And it's an explanation of all the anagrams in Number of the Beast and all the different names. And, and basically, it's every time in Number of the Beast, you had a character and you looked at them and said, that's a weird name, like Neil O'Hare Brain right. and things like that. All of those are anagrams for Heinlein, Virginia Heinlein, or his various pen names. And the, uh, the, the Beast at the end, um, and Steve alluded to this a little bit, turns out to be Robert Heinlein, the author, who, who has been the one who's been chasing after them and, and giving them hell the whole book. And if you could track down that essay and, and read it. It's, it's a lot of fun. I, 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 my, my favorite name in there is the, is the convention services company that's running the big con at the end, Torn, Hernia, Lean, and Snob. Yes, yes. And, and is... is what is their, their motto? Something about not nine something rings hollow. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't remember that one. It's just the name has always stuck with me. And of course it's a, it's an anagram. Mm -hmm. So the question that I had and that obviously, um, um, Neil O'Hart brain was in, was in Pantera, right? How many, how many of that full list were in the story as it was told? Or is it, is it because things are not that, not that many? I, um, I didn't it, notice any others. The... Yeah, most of them are in the, the big convention scene at the end. All right, so he can't, so again, Heinlein being clever. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think one other, Bernie, Bernie Hibble, the ranger, because that's yeah. identical mm -hmm. pages. That was, a, that was another Bob, I think it was Bob Heinlein. Yep, and, uh, and uh, Anouk from France just said the same thing too. So he, he got it before you did. So kudos to you. Good. Um, uh, I, I kind of would like to introduce, John, I mentioned this before we started. Um, there was an essay, and it's on the uh, Heinlein, for, uh, Heinlein Society webpage, a brief essay by a man uh, named uh, David Potter. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, also went by Garlane of Edor. Um, explaining that the number of the beast was a practical joke pulled on the science fiction community because it was a manual on how to write good fiction by giving you lots of examples of how to do it badly. And that mm. that was what a lot of the bickering was about. Yeah, and that, that was what a lot of the, um, I, and I think probably um, I enjoyed Number of the Beast so much more because of that aspect. 
even though at 15, I didn't know it was there the first time I read it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with this book the first time I read it. And, and people look at me funny because it's on a lot of people's lists of the, the five worst that he wrote. Yeah. Um, but that was the book that made me a Heinlein fan. And I, I think there was a certain, a certain spice and humor and, and, you know, wink of the eye quality to it. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of fun. He said he destroyed, he wanted the manuscript of Pankara destroyed because, not because it was a bad book, but because it was a mediocre book. Okay, and that, that actually goes right to something that Nancy has said in the chat, you know, why did he decide to publish? So he felt it was mediocre. Um, and then, but, but being Heinlein, he, he never threw away any, any kind of idea that he had. Yeah. He went back to that reference file and finished it about, you know, roughly a year later, right? He, he went and said, okay, I can work with this. I'm, I'm going to reuse and I'm going to take it this other way. And, and you know, it, it, I just, I've said this before, you know, Heinlein's later work, one of the things that, that I think is lacking in it is that he really needed a strong editor to stand up to him. And I wonder what, what you know, Steve, you love Number of the Beast, but, but I, I haven't. You know, what, what would it have been like if he, if he had those points in there but had a stronger editor at that time too? He, by that point, he was Heinlein. And, you know, he, other than Ginny pushing back on him, he didn't have a lot of that. So, um, you know, as an observation. I wonder at that point if there was an editor that could have done it. I, I, yeah. Or would have dared. Well, yeah, there's definitely that. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think of who the writer was. It, it was a mainstream writer, um, someone in the, in the caliber of James Patterson, but not him. But I, I remember reading an, an interview with him where he said he'd gotten to the point where no editors would even try to edit his stuff. And he felt like he really needed an editor to come in and, you know, he, that part of his writing process was to rely on the editor to catch all kinds of stuff and, and bounce things off of. And, and he was really sad that there were no editors that would do that for him. I somehow can't think of Heinlein be having that attitude. Yeah, I, uh, and if anybody on the chat uh, that, that knows Heinlein history and the archives better to say if there's anything he ever said in a letter or you know, within those discussions about motivations, we'll, we'll try to, you know, riff off of that as well. Um, you know, I, I, and so, so he didn't like it. He thought it was mediocre. He always wanted to put the best thing that he could, but then the, the final thing was this treatise. It was this, you know, I'm going to show you by the bickering and whatever. And, you know, whether, whether you enjoy that or not, whether you're learning from it or whether you just wanted some fun, you know, those are the varying opinions that come out. But yeah, I, I was really surprised when I when I sat down and I had Pankara in hand and I read it, how much more I just enjoyed the flow of reading the story than I did with Number of the Beast. And again, it's been quite a long time since I've read it. I need to go back as a 50-some-year-old person now and reread it and see if I get that same sort of thing like you did, Steve, on that. But, um, no, I, I, mean, I have to agree. Yeah. I, I, I found it much smoother reading. I, I also didn't feel like I had to work as hard as, as a reader. Um, so, and that may ha relate to why he felt that way about it. Um, I, I, it kept reminding me, maybe because I had read just recently when I, when I read Pankara, but it kept reminding me of the puppet masters, hmm. not in any specific detail, but just the way the story flowed. Um, it's hmm. a, it's a bloodthirstier book. Uh, yeah, it is. The, the, the statements are there in Number of the Beast of I want to wipe them all out of existence, but in, mm -hmm. in Pankara, they do it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the, the things that's, that I still haven't analyzed why I feel this way, but I really liked the Barsoom sequences a lot better than the um, British colony on Mars sequences. Um, in, in Number of the Beast. That, that, that was always my least favorite part of the book. But I wondered how it would be perceived by people who weren't familiar with Burroughs and, and then the Lensman stuff, how, how people, how it would be received by readers who weren't familiar with Doc Smith. And I wonder if that too may have been a reason that he, he was less happy with how it turned out. To, to my everlasting shame, I will say I don't, I haven't read the Barsoom books. I haven't read, you know, the, oh, the, well, the Burroughs. That, that's a so, good test then. So, so yeah, and, and, and again, I agree that the, the relationship building that was in Pankara and, and the, you know, the way that that flowed, I, I mean, I know enough about it 
um, that I, I got I got what he was paying the homage to. And Lensman, I read I read almost well. I read all of the original Smith Lensman's books. I haven't read some of the sequels that have that have come after that. They're on the to be read shelf, but I haven't gotten there yet. The um, and, and and yet it definitely was smoother. It was uh, you know you got where he was going, and it was more enjoyable to read that those passages than it was when it was when it was transformed for Number of the Beast for me. And actually, there's a um, and Steve, did you have anything you wanted to offer on on that that point? Um, no, I, I think I, I I do think it just comes kind of comes down to difference of difference of taste, difference of what okay. you like. I I I guess I would add. I think possibly part of his, of course I can't speak for him, but I think possibly part of his motivation in saying this one's mediocre and this is the one I'm going to release is he wanted to break a little bit of new ground. Yeah. And whether it succeeded or failed, I think Number tried to break some new ground, whereas mm -hmm. uh, Pankara is pretty straight story, Yeah, plays with the multi-universe thing, but doesn't really, you know, I, had he written Pankara and published it, I don't think you would have seen Cat Who Walks Through Walls or To Sail Beyond the Sunset. Um, so, and, and, and some people might say good, but, <laughs> but I enjoyed well, it. And, and, oh. and, and that's, that's one of the things I don't like about, about all of Holland's books after that is, that, is that in every one, he wound it up like it was going to be his last and he just kind of played and had fun with those pieces. And, and for me, that just wasn't, it wasn't as enjoyable. Not that they're not good to read. Not that you know. Not that you can't get something out by reading and rereading. But yeah, he he followed. For me, that was the formula he picked up, and then said, "Okay, I'm just going to keep wrapping everything and making it tight together because this could be the last one that I do." I've always had that sense from that. Well, there there was a lot going on. Obi. Oh, okay. I can do one more book and go save a person further back in the incest chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Mike the computer. Yeah. Um, but I, I really jazzed on the whole long family thing, you know, the, the, the big soap opera of, and, and I know it's cheesy and, and I know people don't really talk that way in real life, but that was something that I just personally liked. And so I, I kind of, when I started reading Number of the Beast and, and then we hit the Lazarus Long bits, I was like, oh, cool, maybe he'll do this in every book. <laughs> and so there's a parallel. You talk about, uh, John, you hadn't read uh, the Barsoom books. I had not read any Heinlein except the Star Beast when I read Number of the Beast. I had no idea oh, wow. what this long was. <laughs> wow. But immediately had to go and read the ones that introduced him because I enjoyed that interaction so much. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that, that's an interesting way to start off your reading of Heinlein. <laughs> I, I think I've said this before to, in talking to other fans. It, it worked for me because I was a Marvel Comics reader in the 70s and you were always coming in in the middle of the story. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah true, quite true. And I will say to back up, to back up uh, uh, what Don said, Stella was saying it would have been sad not to have had Cat or to sell, you know, added to that. And, and I can see that. Um, but it's just another one of those cases where, yeah, with you know, all those topics and, you know, Don, you said the incest chain, like, yeah, an editor, an editor on that would have been, you know, it was, it was interesting, but, but I, I wonder with this, I've, I've said this for years, I wonder with a strong editor, what those last things would have been like, though, you know, in, in terms of tightness or, or not as many, the, the didactic type stuff or not within there, but, but who was going to stop him at that point? Right, um, yeah. I, there's an interesting parallel. You mentioned the Long family. I, I think I mentioned this in emails we exchanged, um, and I didn't bring it up. In the end of near the end of Pankara, uh, Aresia sends uh, sends the team to to retrieve a live Panky to get one of these monsters alive, and they find out they can't do it. Um, but the sequence in which they grab the first one, who's disguised as a, a sweet old lady. Mm -hmm is very, very similar in, in sequence, in vibe, and feel to when they grab Maureen Long or Maureen That's Johnson true. right before she dies. That's very true. Yeah, I like that. I don't think Maureen bit anybody, but it's possible. Oh, uh, I wouldn't put it past her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and talking about editors, I, I think we also have to remember some of the really bad experiences Heinlein had with editors, um, starting off with the uh, 
no, I shouldn't say her name because she had <laughs> things. But but the the, the, the editor Ooh, I'll say at, it. Um, I'll say it at Scribner's, who um, <laughs> she clashed with in quite a different ways. But I I was thinking earlier, Steve, when you were talking about uh, wanting to take chances, um, his comments about when they were having trouble selling Glory Road, and several editors wanted it to wanted to chop off the end and basically just have it be the fantasy quest story and and Heinlein in grumbles from the grave there there's all these passages about how he you know okay if we really have to do that in order to sell the book we can but there's no point to it because it would be just one more fantasy um and the important part to him was the end that that kind of meta questioned the whole fantasy quest genre and i wondered if that's kind of what he wasn't seeing in pancara that he did feel he did in, in Number of the Beast. Good point. Any reaction, Steve, or? or? I, no, I think, it's, I think it's a very good observation. Okay. I, I, I do think he didn't. Pankara, Pankara touches on that aspect mm -hmm. rather, rather subtly, as I said, the subtle reference to, uh, Zeb says something like, uh, the, these people showed up to help us, and I'm not going to go into, into the, the details of who they were, but if you go back through this manuscript, you'll figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh yeah, that's because he 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 felt like he could only break copyright so much, yeah, and, and couldn't say the Legion of Space showed up and the Enterprise showed up and the you know so, I, no, I think that's a I think that's a that's a very good observation. Okay, I'm going to switch tacks for a second because we have we have one question and question and answer, and I think it jives with something else that was asked in the chat. So um so Linda had has the question here, so we're going to answer that live for um that she's got the British edition of Number of the Beast, uh, first edition, and that, that it was said that um, there was more verbiage in the British edition rather than the American edition. Mm. Um, she hasn't done that work. And then, and then uh, there was, within the chat, Tracy had said something about, um, remember there are two versions of Number of the Beast. And I think that maybe that's alluding to the same thing, but I technically don't have a lot of those details. It's not something that I'm read on. So I don't want to say the wrong thing. So. If you guys know something or if anybody in chat can chime in and give us the, the, the details or, or if there's a web link for something where there's mm. those differences are named, that's something that we can pursue either in the Highland forum afterwards or, or um, you know, or, or, or in the, uh, the, the channel, Discord channel afterwards too. I know when quarantine is lifted where I can go to, to, to compare the two because I know who owns a British edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we're trying to fill the, the time here now. Uh, yeah, you know, no. Uh, Tom, do you know anything about that? I, I just the same kind of vague impression that yeah I think I've heard that that there were differences between the two editions but I can't tell you what they were and, and it's interesting because on the on the Highland forum there's been some discussion um, from from a guy named Roger Christensen who's been doing a bit of line readings and he's he's even found the things in number of the beasts that seem to be different from what what previous editions he's had so I'm wondering when when Kazik went and pulled these things for these reissues were they pulling from different different things that the trust made available and you know had it so that we're seeing a, these things aren't collectible because there's something that wasn't printed in America before or something then and I don't know that it's something that I think we're going to tug on that string after this this 50 minutes is up but um, I, I really want to thank uh, you know Linda and Tracy to be able to say that because I don't know those details and if if someone is is able to, to contribute I see Francesca who's another who's another uh, society member who's chimed in all the way from Italy awesome um, yeah, if you guys if you guys want to go in there, you know, web chat is not um, journalism, so feel free to speculate. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting that um, that you mentioned that the, the different sources, John, because um, a question that came up for me is reading Opus One Seventy Six. There's a couple places where there's just sections missing, and when I read it, I had to pull out Number of the Beast and read that oh. for those pages, but. The, the pages are different in Pankara, and I wondered where they found uh, those, 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 you know, 10 or 12 chapters without all the references to the changing captains and the elections and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, to be able to say that, that the other fact that I had heard through, through Shahid, the publisher, is that there, there were three editors that worked on this, this Pursuit of the Pankara edition. So, I don't know how they broke those things up or not. And I really don't know all those different sources. I, I only know what I could go by pulling for the, ar the archives myself. Yeah. And then what was available through, through that, that PDF copy to be able to get there. So I honestly don't know if they, if they went through the sourced editions for the manuscripts 
of Number of the Beast and and or not. Um, I'm hoping to be able to get that sort of discussion with Shahid uh, at some point. You know, maybe next year. We'll we'll see what he attends. Um, it so. it would be really interesting um, to see to have the people who worked on it talk about the process and and where they got the different things and all like that. But but you have to remember, I'm I'm the guy who bought all of the Christopher Tolkien editions of his father's notes and read every footnote. So when I say it would be interesting, I, I, I don't mean in, in the usual sense. Right, right. Well, again, yeah, the, the, you, have to, you have to be enough of the academic to, and, and have enough of a brain to be able to absorb the details to understand that, that level of discussion. And I admit I'm not even there, even though Hanlon's you know, my, favorite, my favorite author, my favorite science fiction author, I, don't, I can't retain those details myself. Um, I will say, I'll put this plug in here, um, so I don't have to say it again at the end, in terms of the Highland Forum. Um, so it's a group of, of uh, like-minded people, uh, been in existence. As far as I know, the Highland Forum is, is the oldest group that's devoted singly to discussing Highland that's been in existence on the internet or pre. I haven't found anything that's older that's still in existence. Um, and right now the group uh, exists on Facebook as a, as a closed forum. You have, to, you have to come in and agree to some rules for, uh, for, for good discussion. And, and so if you don't like Facebook, you're out of luck because that's where we are. But <laughs> we are currently doing a discussion on, on Pursuit of the Pankara. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to get Shahid and his editors invited in. The discussions normally last about two weeks. So this, is, this, this 50 minutes is just the kickoff for those of you that aren't already members and are interested. Um, and I can I can give you better directions in the Discord afterwards how to, how to find it through Facebook. And the forum is so well managed that mm. um, there's there are people of all different political persuasions there, and with all kinds of different opinions, which uh, as befits readers of Heinlein. But the moderators do a fantastic job of keeping out the fights and the the. Um, trolling and all that. It's, it's a place on the internet that, that is actually a place you can go and enjoy being and, and have intellectual discussions with people. And John, yeah, you know, thumbs up on that. that that's, one, that's very nice of you to say so. And, and really, I wouldn't have been the Heinlein fan that I am today if I hadn't found people back on the Prodigy Network to discuss with. Um, much in the same fashion, but in, in the old dial-up days and say, you know, where I was in Binghamton, New York, I couldn't get this kind of science fiction discussion, but I could log on and I found people who have stayed friends to this day. So, um, and, and that was before the Highland Society, you know, you know, now here I am, I'm the president of the Highland Society. And there's, there's not only do we sponsor things like this, where we can talk about it and, and talk about his scholarly impact and, and do good works and things like that. Um, that didn't exist unless there were a couple of Highland fans that reached out to Jenny Highland and said, you know, we want to do this and, and we want to be Highland's children instead of, you know, where, where he didn't have any direct heirs. Um, that's really neat. So the, good, good point to, uh, oh, and thanks, Sarah, for putting up the link already within this and we can, we can post yes, it good. as well in, in the Discord. Um, so, okay, free form here. I answered Linda's question. No one has put anything more in, in terms of formal q and It seems to be working pretty well within the chat. You, you guys are helping me just see. Got something. I can do okay. a little a little plug. If you haven't read Number of the Beast, I'm going to do my librarian book talk thing. If you haven't read Number of the Beast in a while and you're tracking down an edition, this is the one you want. Yeah. It is, I mean, I have the Virginia edition here as well, but um, because of, this poor old thing may fall apart on me, because of the Richard Powers artwork, and, yes. and probably this doesn't do it justice, but it is a heavily illustrated edition and... Um, and the artwork is absolutely beautiful. It is. So, it's, it's absolutely You know, I actually gave mine away to the Highland for Heroes program, and I'm thinking now i got to go find another one. When, when um, I think I've given away all my extras. I have, a, I have a quirk that every time I see an orphaned Heinlein book that's, you know, <laughs> cheap or free, I grab it. I had like five copies of this edition, but I've given them all away except I, my original. I, I've seen them at various used bookstores. I can I can pick up another one probably, but that's it, it's not hard to come by. But it's no, it a beautiful isn't. edition. Yeah, that's I, I've you know I've got that Virginia edition, the collected the collected works type thing. But and so I try to but I try to keep the things that are special that have introductions by different authors or things like that. And that our artwork is a is a good reason to have that. So and, and Highline um, fans for the low low price of sixteen hundred dollars. If, <laughs> if I uh, love Highline, 
The Virginia edition is you can, everything he ever you, wrote. You can I, bet you, except except for the typo on the one spine that we won't bring up because then we won't we'll discuss that now. I, uh, so, I, I mean, I, I hope you will take this in the spirit in which it is meant. Um, as someone who doesn't have any Virginia Heinlein editions, um, I hate and despise both of you to the bottom. Of <laughs> <laughs> let's let's hold that thought for a second because I think where we're going. I do want to point out Kyle's. For everybody, if if you're not seeing chat or not, but Kyle, who who, if I remember correctly, I'm I'm getting the name. Kyle's a lifetime member of the society, and and I see him every Balticon, so I'm glad I haven't broken my streak, for Kyle. But um, he's got some data in there about how how original editing, and then when when the English Library bought it and put it over, they accidentally sent the unedited TypeScript, so that's why it's 100 pages longer. So yeah. for that, that's a collectible then that now uh, all of us are going to have to search out for, for the reasoning behind it. Oh, yeah. Um, although I guess if you if you buy it from the, the archives or something, you have the same thing. So Kyle, thanks for chiming in on that, because I love it when I can learn something too in the course of the panel. Great. If I, and if I, if John, I, before, I before you jump into some of the questions I see are waiting, um, you mentioned something called Heinlein for Heroes. Could you give us a little bit more information about that? Sure. So, um, so you're setting me up, so I have to say less at the end. Um, oh, so okay. the, the Highland Society as a, um, um, as a, uh, uh, runs several programs, Key. Um, so the t-shirt I'm wearing right now has the, the oh, I can't even do it, for, for the SF pin. Um, Highland created that during his lifetime and the society still gives it out to blood donors. We're running virtual blood drives right now. So if you normally would give it Balticon or, or if, you've, if you give and you've never gotten a pin from, from the ghost of Robert Highland, um, we will send you one. You just have to send us an email showing us that you donated somehow a picture on the chair or a picture of your, your donation form or something is fine and we give you that pin from from the ghost of bob Highland, which uh which i love i have one of the original well, one of the last sets that he did is one of one of my treasures but uh but, but we print them up and we give them out we give out a huge number of dragon con every year that's one program Highland for heroes is uh what we send um mostly paperbacks but we send to serving serving military abroad we send to va hospitals and families that are either a continental U.S. or abroad, uh, where we send science fiction, and we always send at least one or a couple Highlands in every batch that we do. So, so we fundraise for that. You can donate directly for that program. Your membership dues go to that. That's that's one of the programs. We give STEM scholarships, um, and we have um, homeschool materials available to be able to teach science fiction, including Highland works, which is particularly relevant now with COVID. Um, and I feel like I'm I'm missing one of our one of our major programs, but uh, but I'll, I'll catch it at the end. <laughs> within there too. Um, okay, so are there other questions? There are some other questions here. So uh, let's see what we're- Oh, Betsy's been busy. Yeah, Betsy's asking a lot of Hi, questions. Betsy. Hi, Betsy. The three of us know Betsy. All of you get should get a chance to, to meet Betsy at some point. Um, all right. This is, you're all looking at me reading. How, how, how lovely is that for you, entertaining? I am, um, I haven't, renewed my glasses prescription for quite a while so um if i were reading it would be more like this <laughs> oh, yeah because i have the q a wait <laughs> yeah she's got more observations so the um uh, I'll, I'll say one in here zeb and jake have the same overprotective attitude as other rh characters uh lazarus hugh farnham and and you know dd's speech about marriage to her similar as a number of the beasts kind of the norm for, for Heinlein. That's kind of how he thought and how he chose to, to, to go things. So there really wasn't a question there. <laughs> so just an observation. But, Observations. Yep. But it, so. I did find the, um, the women's objection to that stronger in Pankara. Yes. You know, it, it kind of came off as more of a, um, more conscious of women's rights than the number of the beast. Which, which kind of went along with Heinlein in general. There, yeah, there's, I think it's only in Pankara that, that uh, they have the conversation where, um, are they going to explore these more universes? Yeah. And Zeb and Jake are both kind of saying, well, you guys are pregnant and we need to protect you. And, we, and Zeb says, damn it, Dee Dee, this is one time men, women can't be involved. And she says right back to him, damn it, Zebediah, this is one time women have to be involved. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, I'll, I'll ask um, I'll ask you both to offer an opinion, and, and, and maybe this is a short answer or not. 
did this thing deserve to see the light of day for mass market publication? And, and, and uh, I'll ask Don to answer first. And so Steve gets a few more seconds to answer about it. Did Pursuit of the Pen Carrot deserve to be out there at mass market and amazon.com and, and, and oh, yes. new, new, but new from Robert Heinlein. Is that, is that, is that a good thing? Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, it, and I, I have been wondering kind of in the back of my head why it wasn't a major publisher who, who jumped on this and issued it. And I'm thinking that there are, there are good and sufficient reasons why not. Um, you know, I can see a big publisher saying, well, you know, people have read Number of the Beast. There aren't going to be that many people who are going to be curious enough to want to read this and et cetera. So um, the only thing that gives me pause is when you said for mass market publication. Because I think this is something that is more more interesting to a scholar of Heinlein or to a big fan of Heinlein rather than to a casual reader of Heinlein. Um, so yes, it definitely deserved to see the light of day. It definitely should have been published. It definitely should be widely available. Whether or not it should be like considered essential to the corpus of his work or you know, if you can't call yourself really a Heinlein reader unless you haven't read this, I don't know that I'd go that far. And that's fair. Steve? Um, and I'm of two minds about this because I think it might have been my wife, Renee, who asked me, it might have been somebody else. I think it was Renee who said, well, wait a minute. If, if Heinlein didn't want this published, hmm. yeah. why is it out there? And I said, well, you know, Heinlein lost his vote a long time ago. Yes. I yeah. mean, unfortunately, you become when you're as, as influential and popular as he was, you become more than an individual after you're gone mm -hmm. and there's scholarly interest. So I guess morally, ethically, yes, I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that if he wanted it destroyed, he didn't get around to destroying it, but maybe that was Freudian. Um, mm, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it, it should be available. I would, I would, echoing with Don, um, I wouldn't say you have to have read it to say you're a, you're a real Heinlein fan. Um, and I just say, well, every book is, is somebody's first Heinlein. Yeah. Uh, if this is, if this book makes somebody a, a fan, if this book makes somebody love science fiction and think, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I guess I will say, uh, you know, there's been people that are, are griping about the cover art to this collection and, and, you know, it doesn't really represent the characters, but if the cover art grabs somebody in and they're able to yeah. read something and say, I want to read more, for me, that's, a, you know, from a Highland Society standpoint, that's a good thing. We can talk about these minutia, but was it enjoyable to somebody or not? Did it make somebody some money? That, that, that's kind of a good thing. And that's probably a good way to, to kind of segue in in terms of making somebody some money. Um, for Steve and Don, I don't have anything to plug, but for those that are listening in, you know, 20, 29 or so at this point, um, what's the thing that you'd like to plug about your personal work at this moment? So I'll start with Don. Well, go there. This is weird trying to make my finger do this. Right <laughs> <laughs> but um, go to my website. Um, I, currently, I have one of my ebooks is on sale for 99 cents. It's a uh, uh, dark fantasy set in a fictional Maryland college that has a department of magic and it's kind of like Buffy meets um, Hogwarts. And so you can get that real cheap and um, read my um, reviews in analog. Um, you can read those online for free every, every two months. Um, they, they publish my column as, as part of the one of the things to draw people into the uh, magazine, which I kind of really like. So yeah. Excellent. And Steve. You were looking around your shelves. Did you find I it? I was looking around my shelves. It's embarrassing. I don't have any of my own books here. Um, uh, you can go to, I will, I will in the chat, put my website. Um, you can go to my website. It's just stephenhwilson.com. Um, I, I blog um, sometimes weekly, sometimes not so much. I do science fiction reviews. I'm writing a, a whimsical little thing about finishing the, 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 the house my father left behind when he died. Um, and I do have, I do have about 10, eight, 10 books in print 
um, that, that are listed on my website. Um, I did create a series called The Arbiter Chronicles, which Don has kindly reviewed in Analog, uh, that there are Fun. four books out Very there. Um, and it was also a, a radio show uh, on podcast, so. Excellent. And so I'll wrap up uh, uh, with a couple of points. Number one, thanks to Jeff, who's been our, our stalwart technician. Nothing went wrong, and that's to Jeff's credit. And um, for, for BISFIS and Balticon in general, for doing this virtual Balticon, they're not charging for you guys to do this, but uh, I highly recommend you go to the GoFundMe and contribute what you can for that, because, you know, buy a t-shirt or whatever. I personally donated the money that I saved on not having to pay for parking in, in actual Balticon. So, uh, you know, whatever your budget would that's allow, amazing. I'm sure they would appreciate it. And um, again, HighlandSociety.org. And we will definitely be in the, um, the Highland Society fan table uh, chat channel area on Discord right after this. So the Highland Society, look for us there. And we can continue this and you guys can be a more, uh, an even more active part of this. Um, thank you guys all very much. We are just about at time and I think Jeff will be cutting us off soon. So um, really, really appreciate it. This went very well. Thank you guys for making it painless and for all of you for contributing. Thanks. Thank you, John.